Michael Shermer. He is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, executive director of the Skeptic Society, a monthly columnist for Scientific American, and the author of The Believing Brain. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Shermer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start off with a thought experiment. Imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You're a tiny little Australopithecine afarensis, little brain. Your name is Lucy. <clears throat> Thank you. A lot of people in the Midwest don't get that. <clears throat> <laughs> Evolution? <laughs> what? <laughs> Not that Lucy, the other one. Uh, and, you're, uh, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator? or is it just the wind? If you think that the rustle in the grass is a dangerous predator, and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a type one error in cognition, you've, a false positive. You thought the wind was connected to something and it wasn't. A was connected to B and it wasn't. Uh, so that's a false positive, but that's relatively harmless. But if you think that the rustle in the grass uh, is just the wind and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, you're lunch. Congratulations, you've just been given a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. <laughs> and we are the descendants of those who are most likely to make type 1 errors, false positives, versus type 2 errors, false negatives. That is to say, why can't you just stay in the grass and collect enough data to get the answer right? And the answer is that predators don't wait around for prey animals to collect more data. That's why they stalk and sneak up on their prey animals, so they can't get enough data. So we evolved the propensity to make snap decisions and make one kind of error more likely than another kind of error. And that kind of error, that false positive, that's superstition. That's magical thinking. That's assuming A is connected to B. It's a true pattern, and it isn't, and you're wrong. That's the basis of finding false patterns like gods. Now, what's the difference between the wind and a dangerous predator? The wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. And his intention is to eat me, and that can't be good. So what we also do, in, in, in addition to finding these meaningful patterns, is infuse in them agency. That, that is, it's alive, it's real, it has intention, and its intention is not good, so I better assume it's real. And this is the basis of animism and spiritism and polytheism and monotheism and the belief in angels and aliens and demons and spirits and poltergeists and gods. Gods are invisible agents who run the world, who control things, who create these patterns, who are these patterns that we use to explain things. All cultures everywhere in the world have created god beliefs. Gods with these intentional uh, uh, that are intentional agents. So my question tonight is not, uh, like in my book, why do so many people believe in God? Here's a theory, which I just outlined for you. But for tonight, I want to ask, what's more likely? That our opponents here happen to pick the right God and the right religion among all the, about 10,000 different religions and about 1,000 different gods that humans have con constructed socially, anthropologically, psychologically, uh, in the last 10,000 years. 10,000 different religions, 1,000 different gods. Our opponents agree with us that 999 of those gods are false gods. They are atheists like we are atheists. What I'm asking you to do is just go one god further with us. <laughs> So here's what happened. <clears throat> uh, about five to 7,000 years ago, these small bands of hunter-gatherers began to coalesce into chiefdoms and states. As long as the numbers are small, informal means of behavior control and moral enforcement operate quite well. As soon as the numbers are too large for these informal means, shunning, making people feel guilty, gossiping about them, making them feel embarrassed for their bad behavior, as soon as the populations are big, there's too much opportunity for free riding and for cheating the system and taking advantage of it and getting away with it. So two institutions evolved. Government to set up a set of rules and everybody gets a copy. And religion, in case you think you got away with it, you didn't because there's an eye in the sky that knows all and sees all and keeps track of this. So this is the second part of how humans construct religions and gods because we need it 
for moral enforcement. It just so happens, by contingency and chance, religion and government was the first on the scene. Now, what's happened in the last several centuries since the Enlightenment, in addition to the trajectory that Professor Krauss outlined for you, science displacing religion as the primary means of explaining how the world works, something else has also happened. We've slowly but ineluctably replaced religion as the primary source of our morals and, and came up with the clever idea that you actually have to have a reason why you have uh, certain moral principles and we're going to write certain laws. You actually have to give evidence for why you think this is a good law or a bad law or a good moral principle or a bad moral principle. And that has been the trajectory of the Enlightenment since um, about 200 years ago. And so again, what's more likely that um, one of them happens to be the one true religion and the one true God and all those others that have been constructed are false gods or that, as we can clearly see, anthropologically, soci socially, soci psychologically, and so on, this is what people do to get along. They construct religions, they construct moral systems, and so on. We now know that we can do this without gods. In fact, we do it quite well without gods. Northern European countries do just fine with much lower rates of religiosity than we have. It is possible to do that, and that is what we've been doing. Now, I, I want to finish 